The next bonus they have is Warfare Link. Not many people exploit that. They also have a triage module, which allows them to do ridiculous amounts of repair. It's a bit like a siege module for a Dreadnought, which I'll cover shortly. When they're in triage, they can't be warp scrambled, and they can't fall victim to any electronic warfare. But they can't be remote repaired, they can't receive support in terms of remote repair and remote capacitor transfer. So it does make them vulnerable. And this sort of siege mode, this triage mode, does last for a few minutes. So it does sort of commit them to the fight. What it does do is allow them to lock very quickly and they can remote repair the fleet very, very effectively. They get bonuses to lock speed, they get bonuses to remote repair. It basically makes them a repair platform. And finally, they get a bonus to fighter control range. So they can send the fighters longer distances, way out of the 45 kilometer range that drones would normally be restricted to without modules. So that's carriers. Next up are the dreadnoughts. Now, again, dreadnoughts are capital ships, and they are very expensive, and they require a lot of skills to fly. Dreadnoughts are most suitable at killing other capital ships, or control towers, or other sovereignty structures. They are not really able to hit battleships unless they're not moving. They're not really able to hit anything smaller than the battleship at all, because their guns are capital size so they just don't have the tracking or the capability of even hitting small ships. Now what makes a Dreadnought interesting is that its DPS comes from its siege mode. It has a siege module in its hide slot and this siege module gives it a 650% bonus to damage. This bonus is what makes it deadly but it's also a limitation because when you activate your siege module like the carrier it's stuck. It can't move and it can't receive remote repair or remote capacitor transfer. The cycle time for the siege module is also 10 minutes, so as soon as a dreadnought goes in siege, it's committed to the fight for the next 10 minutes. Next, I want to talk about super capitals. Now, what I've done is unchecked show only available so that I can actually view the super carrier first of all. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that it's in the carrier section. That's because a supercarrier is a big carrier. It has all the same bonuses that a carrier has, but it can launch more fighters and it can also use fighter bombers. Fighter bombers are like fighters, but they can't be delegated and they're very very effective at killing other capital ships. The other thing you'll notice is that it's got something called projected electronic countermeasures. This is basically a remote ECM blast. So you can fire at another battleship that's say 150 kilometers away and then 15 kilometers radius around that battleship is where the ECM effect occurs. So all of those ships in that radius will then lose their lock potentially. So it's a very, very effective weapon, sometimes ignored unfortunately. And the other super capital I want to talk about is the Titan which again just like the super carrier is not able to dock in a station because it's just too big and it also has quite a few bonuses that you should be familiar with so that you can understand what it can do first of all it can create a clone bat bay not too interesting it just allows the ship to be able to give jump clones to other people it can do jump portal generation now this is very very important to know if you know that the enemy has a titan then they can basically jump their fleet to a Sinosaur field or a beacon in another system and they can basically jump from the Titan's location to where the Sino is and move their fleet of battleships through. So you need to bear in mind that that is a possibility. It's also got a super weapon which is a one shot one kill weapon. It's normally used for killing other capital ships so it can basically one shot kill carriers and dreadnoughts. Now if you know the enemy has got a Titan on the field or available to them, you need to be very careful with your Dreadnought or your Carrier because you could basically be one-shotted. The other bonuses are to its turret damage which basically allow it to do ridiculous amounts of damage with its weapons. Now obviously the Amar will have a turret bonus, the Kaldai will have a missile bonus, etc. 
but its guns basically do very, very heavy damage, so it's very, very useful for shooting other capital ships again, just like a dreadnought. It's also worth mentioning that both super capitals are immune to electronic warfare. Completely immune, there's no way around it. The only way to tackle a super capital is with an interdictor bubble or a heavy interdictor, using either the script or just having its bubble next to the super capital. So as that briefly covers all of the Tech 1 ship classes available in EVE Online, let's move on to the interesting stuff. The Tech 2 classes. What I'd like to cover first are the Interceptors. So let's just find those in the menu. There they go. Minimize Titans. Open up Galante. And what you'll notice is that each race has two Interceptors. The first Interceptor, the Ares, will have a bonus, and all races are like this. They've got one Interceptor that has a bonus for the Warp Scrambler and Warp Disruptor range. And the other Interceptor type, uh, the Tyrannus, the Galante, has a bonus to hybrid tracking. Now for other races, like for the Kaldai for example, that would be a bonus to missile velocity. But basically it's a more combat orientated, more damage orientated bonus. So what becomes quickly apparent is that one of the interceptors is more suited for damage and one of them is more suited for actual tackling, catching stuff quickly. In this case the Ares is suitable for catching stuff quickly. So the Ares is the one that you'd use in the large fleets where they need a dedicated tackler to lock ships quickly and catch them and warp scramble them so the rest of the fleet can then do the damage. The actual damage the Ares can do is very very minimal. In fact most people perhaps consider not even fitting guns on the Ares because it's just cheaper. All the Ares needs is the low slots and the mid slots and the rigs. So you don't need to bother with the guns anyway because you do so little DPS it's not worth worrying about. So they just fit the warp scrambler or the warp disruptor, the important bit. The Tyrannus on the other hand has a drone bay and it has its turrets and they actually do quite a lot of damage. So the Tyrannus is better suited for smaller fleets. And you'll find that with all races where one of the interceptors will be better for large fleets and one of them will be better for small fleets. And it's worthwhile getting used to both of them and having both of them available in your hangar. So when a fleet up is starting, depending on how large it is, you can get a feel of what interceptor is probably better to bring if the FC says, yeah, bring your interceptor. The next Tech 2 ship I want to cover are the Assault Ships. Now, these are damage dealing ships, very good at killing other frigates. They can take a lot of damage as well, and they can also deal a lot of damage. They do, however, also have the capability of being good roaming ships for solo use. So you can just fly around on your own in an assault ship and actually do pretty well against other frigate class ships. Now, each race will have two assault ships available to it and they have different bonuses again and they actually vary from races but in general both are good at dealing damage and both are good at tanking so in the case of the Galente we've got a ship that's dedicated to turrets the Enyo and you've got the Ishkar which is better suited for using drones now depending on which one you want to fly is pretty much personal preference what type of method of DPS you like doing and each of the races have their own styles of assault ships and you can basically fly both or just fly whatever you prefer and whatever you most enjoy. After the assault frigates we've got the stealth bombers. Now the stealth bombers will be under the category of covert ops and if we have a look at the Kaldari for example we've got the buzzard which is the covert ops frigate and then if we scroll down we can see the manticore in full which is the stealth bomber now the stealth bomber is a very specific role they're very very difficult ships to fly you need to lose maybe 20 of them before you actually get the hang of it and they get some very specific bonuses you'll notice they've got bonuses to bombs and they've got bonuses to torpedoes and then they've got roll bonuses they can use siege missile launchers they can also use covert ops cloaks and they don't get a targeting delay after they've uncloaked, so they can lock instantly. 
they can also fit the covert sinusoidal field generators. Now as it fits torpedoes, it makes it very effective at doing damage to other battleships. You normally need a few bombers to be able to take out a battleship, but they're very very effective and they deal actually quite a lot of DPS to the larger ship. It's worth noting though that while you can do a lot of damage for a frigate class ship, that's your paper thin. Just a few shots and you can pop instantly. They're very very fragile. You need to make sure you're not locked. As soon as you think the enemy are getting able to lock you, if they're getting in range, or if they've locked you and they're about to fire, you need to get safe, you need to cloak up, or just make sure that you're not going to die because it just takes a few hits before you can die. It can also use the bombs which I mentioned before and that's actually going to be discussed later in fall because that requires its own section because of its complexity but basically bombs don't require you to lock before you fire them. You move your ship in the direction you want to fire the bomb, you push the bomb button, a bomb flies out of the front of your bomber for 30 kilometers, and then anything in a 15 kilometer range of that bomb takes damage. That damage is modified by the signature radius of the ships it's hitting, so frigates will take less damage, but if ships have got their micro warp drives on so their signature radius is larger, then they will take considerably more damage and in most cases pop if they're frigates or interceptors or such. But I will cover bombers and the techniques of using the bomb launcher in full in another section. So after the stealth bomber, I'm going to move on to the covertops. Now the covertops again can use the covertops cloak, and it can also fit the covert sinusaur field generator. However, it lacks the damage capability of the stealth bomber. So it's mostly used for scouting, it has got bonuses to scanning, so it can scan enemy ships down, and that's about it. It's not really suitable for actual live fire combat. You'd use it to find ships for other people, or you'd use it to scout fleets for other people. The final tech to hull for the frigate is the electronic warfare frigate. Now these are very very effective electronic warfare batteries basically, but again they don't have much armour. As soon as you're locked you've got to be very careful because it only takes a few shots to kill you. They do however have bonuses in their racial electronic warfare ability. So for the Galente it has a bonus to sensor dampener effectiveness and capacitor use. It also has a bonus to warp disruptor range and warp disruptor capacitor use. So it's very similar to the recon ships that we'll discuss shortly. It doesn't have the DPS though to really solo with, but it's effective in fleets if you want to learn later how to fly recons. They're a cheaper way to get used to what recons can do perhaps.